let's elaborate on these notions of randomness and independence as we build toward being able to talk about hash functions that are independent. Okay, so let's say, for example, we already know that to make hash functions that are able to distribute elements uniformly across the range of the hash function and to be able to do this regardless of the input um, requires some randomness. You know, there's some way of, of, of mixing in some randomness in order to achieve that result. So if we wanted to make two hash functions, h1 and h2, and we wanted each of them to be uniform, right, to, to, to spread things out, that would require some amount of randomness. And if we, on the other hand, wanted to make two hash functions such that they were both uniform and independent, so, uh, or another way of, of intuitively thinking about this is that the two hash functions, if you think about the, now this is a square that's uh, describing the joint ranges of the two hash functions, we want to spread things smoothly out over the entire square. Uh, so that's going to require even more randomness. So it's one thing to make uniform uh, random hash functions. It's another thing to make uh, independent uh, uh, uniformly random hash functions. Okay, so we need to discuss a bit more how do we get this notion of independence and how much randomness do we need and what kind of randomness do we need to achieve it. So uh, true, true randomness, you know, a, a source of randomness that's truly unpredictable, that's very hard. Um, ultimately, it sort of comes down to being able to observe something in the environment that's very chaotic or unpredictable. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in another era, uh, it was accomplished by, you know, sort of you would buy a book that was full of random numbers and... And, and those random numbers themselves hopefully were generated from some very uh, unpredictable process. Um, and, but the important point that we'll use here is that, let's say that you have a good source of randomness. There's a way of taking really, really good randomness and sort of amplifying it so that you get uh, maybe not quite as good a notion of randomness, but you get more of it. You get more of a weaker, weaker form of randomness. And this is going to turn out to be sufficient for some ways in which we want to apply independent hash functions. So the key is how do we do this sort of amplification? Okay, so let's spend a little time with definitions since we're going to talk about independence. And we're going to distinguish between uh, mutual independence and other kinds of independence. So let's start by talking about mutual independent, mutually independent events first. Then we'll move on to talking about mutually independent random variables. Okay, so if I have uh, events e sub one up through e sub k, and they are they are mutually independent if and only if for any subset i in the uh, integers one up to k, I can write that the probability. So the probability of, and then I'm going to write big intersection, i, little i element of big I, where big I again is this subset of E sub i. So the probability of all of them happening equals the product, this is big pi, over the same events of the probability of that event. Okay. So in other words, if they're mutually independent, and I'd like to know what's the probability of some coincidence of events, it equals the product of their probabilities. Okay. A visualization that, that might help, this is often how I, how I end up thinking of it, is that if we have a sample space, let's, I've just drawn schematically my sample space as a rectangle here, my sample space omega. If two events basically correspond to orthogonal strips of that sample space, so A is this vertical strip and B is this vertical strip, um, then if I want to know what's the probability of A and B, I'm going to multiply the uh, strip widths, right? Both of those strip widths are some fraction of the total width. 
I can multiply them to get the probability of both happening. All right, sometimes it's convenient to think in terms of this diagram when thinking of independence, but also about when thinking about uh, conditional probabilities. All right, so probability of A and B equals joint probability of A and B equals probability of A times probability of B when they are independent. So that's events. Let's say that two random variables, x and y, are independent when the probability that x equals a particular value small x and y equals a particular value small y equals probability that big X equals X times probability big Y equals Y. Right? So the probability that they are that they the um, values that X and Y take on coincide uh, coincide to a particular pair of values equals the product of the probability that each of them separately takes on their respective values. So how about if you had several random variables, not just two? We'd say that this whole collection of k random variables are mutually independent when, for any subset, big I, uh, of them, and particular values x sub i for i in the number of things in that subset, I have that the probability of big intersection of i little i in big i that x sub i equals little x sub i equals sort of parallel to the event version of this right i just multiply the probabilities in for each of them okay and again, we can look at a diagram now thinking in terms of random variables. Now these, ra these are two separate random variables, possibly with separate sample spaces. So the, um, this is, you can think of the sample space of random variable A as being arrayed along the horizontal and the sample space of random variable B as being arrayed along the vertical. But then again, what independence means in this case is that the way uh, the space is divided up, it's like orthogonal strips, right? Vertical strips for the different values that A can take on, having different probabilities, and horizontal strips for B. Therefore, if I want to know what's the probability of some coincidence, like the coincidence that A equals 2 and B equals 1, I'm going to multiply those strip widths. I'm going to multiply those uh, separate uh, probabilities. Okay, so when we have independence between uh, two random variables, this kind of flavor of independence would be called, well, I should say, if we have a collection of random variables, and the kind of independence that we have would only really work for subsets of two random variables, well, then what we have is what's called pairwise independence, right? So whereas those previous equations were for general subsets, if it only works for subsets of two, then we have pairwise independence. And then you can think about levels of independence that go beyond pairwise. You can think about threewise independence, where subsets up to three have independence. Okay? And so on, right? You can think up to k-wise independence, and then arbitrary subsets would be full mutual independence. Okay. So what would be an example where we have say pairwise independence, this somewhat, let's say, weaker notion of independence, but we don't have this somewhat stronger notion of threewise independence. Okay, well, let's think of an example. So let's go to a die, a fair die rolling example. And so here I've got my um, two dice, and uh, I roll both dice, and here's my sample space of possible outcomes of rolling those two dice. And I've already defined two events here. I've defined event A, which is the uh, event that die 1 equals 3. So that corresponds to this horizontal strip from the sample space. And then I've defined event B, which is that die 2 equals 4. That's this vertical strip of the sample space. Now what I'd like to do is come up with an event C so that um, pairwise independence holds between uh, any pair of these three events 
right? So there's clearly pairwise independence between A and B, right? Because what's the probability of A? One sixth. What's the probability of B? One sixth. What's the probability of A and B? One thirty sixth, right? So that's the definition of, of uh, independence, pairwise independence between A and B. So what's an event C that we could define? Well, let's define the event C as, uh, let's see, we wanted to go through that same square where A and B already coincide. And we want it to, um, so yeah, so let's try this. Let's try this as our event C. Okay, in other words, what's event C? It's the probability that the die rolls sum to seven. Right? These are, the, these are the squares where the two die rolls sum to 7. Okay? So let's say event C is sum of dice equals 7. Okay? Well, let's work through um, whether we have uh, pairwise independence. So let's ask probability of A, what's the probability of A and B? Uh, well, that's 136th. We already discussed that which equals 1 sixth times 1 sixth, which equals probability of A times probability of B. Will this be true if we also do A and C? Well, yeah, right, because A and C, again, also coincide just in one square. So I'm going to end up, plus uh, A and C both have probability 1 sixth. So same holds. That works. So the only other pair I need to do is B and C. C. Same deal. 136. They coincide again just in that one spot. 1 6 times 1 6, which equals probability of B times probability of C. Okay, so what's that telling us? That's telling us that we have pairwise independence among these three random variables, among these three events, I should say. Okay, so pairwise independence, check. Okay, so how about threewise independence? So let's write down um, what's the probability of A and C, uh, sorry, A and B and C. Well, again, they coincide in one square, 1 out of 36. So that's 1 out of 36. But what do we get when we multiply probability of A, probability of B, probability of C? Something bigger than that, right? 1 times, 1 over 6 times 36, so 216, right? So those are not equal. These are not equal. So we do not have three wise independence. Okay, so you can see that there's kind of a uh, strongness to these higher numbers of k-wise independence compared to, say, pairwise independence or two-wise independence. But it turns out that pairwise independence is just enough independence for a lot of different applications. So if we could find a way to take a little bit of, let's say, full mutual independence of some random draws, you know, we found a good source of randomness, uh, and so we took a few draws from it. But we'd like to now amplify that to get more pairwise independent random variables. How would we go about doing that? Well, we're going to examine this f uh, later with hash functions, but we'll examine it first with bits, just, just pairwise independent bits. Okay, and so let's start with an example that appropriately uses coin flips. So let's say, given a few mutually independent coin flips, so these are uh, mutually independent fair coin flips. Can I construct many pairwise independent coin flips? This is the question. So I've got the most independence, most randomness, most r independence I can possibly have, which is full mutual independence between these four coin flips. I'd like to turn that into a larger number of pairwise independent coin flips. Okay, so here are my coin flips. Now, visualize 
uh, bear with me here. Here's a visualization of basically all different ways that we can take a subset of these four coin flips. Or to be more specific, all different ways we can take a non-empty uh, subset of these four coin flips. And so if you look at each row of this, uh, each row of this grid here, each row has at least one gray square in it, right? Sometimes there's, you know, here, this one has two gray squares, this one has three gray squares, this one has four gray squares. The, but each row has at least one. And all the rows are different because they're all different subsets. And what the gray is denoting is that we will use the coin flip at the top of that column in order to calculate a new coin flip in that row. And then if it's white, that means we're not going to use that coin flip. Okay. All right, so let's switch now from using, uh, from letting the coin flips be uh, a hidden thing to say, let's say we went ahead and flipped the coins, and let's say these are the particular values we had, we got from those four coin flips for concreteness. So let's say we flipped the coins and we got, you know, tails, heads, tails, heads. What this table is telling us is how to construct um, a larger set of outcomes from those four outcomes. Specifically, I'm going to take these four coin flips and I'm now going to propagate them down so that I'm writing them in every gray uh, element in the column below. Okay, so this zero got written in all the grays in that column. This one got written in all the grays in that column, and so on. And then for each row, I'm going to combine everything in that row using the exclusive or operator. All right, so I'm using the cross inside a circle to represent exclusive or. Let's just remind ourselves what exclusive or does. So let's just write down a nice little truth table. All right, so if my inputs, let's call them A and B, X or B. So if A is zero and B is zero, then A X or B is zero. If A is 0, B is 1, then A X or B is 1. If A is 1, B is 0, then A X or B is 1. So, so far, X or behaves like or, right? But now, here's the case where they differ. So if A is 1 and B is 1, then A X or B is 0, okay? All right, so it's, it's notable that half the outcomes are 1 for X or. All right? But it's just a function that we can use to combine the zeros and ones we have in each row to get a new number. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's apply XOR, and here are the numbers we get out. Right? So for example, uh, let's pick an, uh, an interesting row. So here, this row has a 0 and a 1. So 0 XOR 1 is 1. OK, great. This row has 1, 0, 1. 1 XOR 0 is 1. XOR result is 1. 1 XOR 1 is 0, so the final result for that row is 0, okay? And not too surprisingly, I've got about half 1s, half zeros here because the outcome from the XOR operator is a 50% chance of being 1 or 0 for random inputs. Okay, so now my question is, are these pairwise independent? In other words, did I just take four mutually independent coin flips and generate this larger number, 15, pairwise independent coin flips. And the argument uh, that we have to go through to convince ourselves that that is the case is going to look like this. Okay. So I've, I took away the particular example. Now I'm back to thinking of the columns as just coin flips that could go either way. They're now back to being mutually independent random coin flips, uh, random variables. Okay. Now let's consider, since pairwise independence is concerned with any pair of the pairwise independent random variables, let's just consider a pair of rows of this matrix. So let's consider these two rows. Let's call them A and B. And what you'll notice is that for any pair of rows, there's always going to be some column where those two rows differ in terms of whether they are using the coin flip or not. So in this particular example, uh, these two rows actually have this, this, and this, 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 and this, are all the same, gray, gray, white, gray, gray, white. But here I've got white, and here I've got gray. And we'll always be able to find some column where there's a difference, because after all, each of the rows is a different subset of the four coin flips. So because they're each a different subset, there must be at least one column where they disagree 
Right? You can sort of visually confirm that if you go through and look at a bunch of pairs of rows. But it's true by construction because each of these rows is a different subset. Okay? All right, so we've identified a column where there's a difference in terms of whether those rows do or don't include the coin flip. Let's pick another pair of rows just to confirm that's true here as well. Yep. All right, so here it's the same, white, white. Here it's different, white, gray. Gray, 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 white. It only needs to be different for one column, so the fact that these two, this has two columns that are different doesn't really matter. We just need at least one. All right, so there's a column with a difference. And then what we're going to do to analyze the situation and convince ourselves that we're going to end up with pairwise independent random variables is we want to apply the principle of deferred decisions, which is basically the outcomes of these coin flips, they're mutually independent. They don't necessarily happen in any particular order. Right? So the coin flips don't happen in some order, and therefore we're not calculating the exclusive ors taking the coin flips into account into a, in a particular order either. But it can, we can, in doing the analysis without loss of generality, consider that there is a particular order to the coin flips. And in particular, let's take the column where we observed a difference and say that's the coin flip that happens last. Okay? So we're going to do all the other work first. We'll flip the other three coins first, and then we'll calculate our um, uh, partial exclusive ors in each row. And then the last thing that happens is we flip the last coin, and the last coin flip affects one row but not the other, and we factor that new coin flip into our exclusive or. And that's, in, in our argument, that's what happens last. Again, it doesn't matter what order things happen in, but we can analyze the situation without loss of generality by saying that fourth coin flip is what happens last, the one where there's a column with a difference. Okay, so that means that after we've flipped the other three coins and done all that calculation, and now we come to take the final coin flip into account, that final coin flip is only going to affect one row or the other, right? So if there was any dependence up until this point, like for example, if all the other columns uh, ended up exactly the same, because as, as in this first example, right, obviously we'll have the same uh, partial exclusive or in this row and this row and uh, uh, taking these three coin flips into account because it's the same pattern of gray and white in both those rows outside of this column. But this final coin flip breaks the dependence, right? Basically uh, by leaving the coin flip that's in the column that has a difference to the end of the analysis, we're saying that final co coin flip uh, breaks the tie and we have pairwise independence. And so this holds for all pairs of rows. Okay, so we can always find a column with a difference for any pair of rows, and that's true, like we said before, by construction. Uh, a question we can ask is, if we have pairwise independence, if we've successfully sort of amplified four mutually independent coin flips up into 15 pairwise independent coin flips, maybe we can get greedy and ask, well, do we also have like three-wise independence? Okay, but this is going to go a little bit too far. We don't have three-wise independence. So for example, pick three sets of rows that look like this. Right? Obviously, three-wise independence is not going to be achievable because one of the rows is completely predictable once you know the other two rows. Right? You know, it's, it's, it can't possibly be, we can't possibly have three-wise independence when um, uh, basically a combination of two other rows means there's, if you aggregate those two rows first, there's now no longer a difference in which coin flips have been taken into account between those two and the third one. So we can't get three-wise independence, but we do have just enough to get two-wise independence. So we successfully amplified four mutually independent coin flips up into 15 pairwise independent coin flips, where pairwise is a weaker notion of independence, but as we'll see later, it's uh, sufficient in a lot of situations.